Hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar on how admissions are decided. My name is Bianca. I'm a part of the quad education team. Um, we are an academic consultation firm, and we are dedicated to helping you improve your college profiles and get into your dream college. So as I mentioned today, we are going to talk about how admissions are decided and reviewed and what happens after you submit your application. Um, we're going to first start by going over today's agenda. We will introduce our lovely panelists. Today we have Ariana Lee and Daryl Tiggle. And then afterwards, we will be talking about what happens as you or after you submit your primary application. We're then going to talk about how applications are reviewed then what you do once you've submitted your application, and then we're gonna go over some tips uh, to boost your chances of getting into your school of choice. At the end, once we've finished our presentation, we'll be um, having a Q&A section. There should be a box, Q&A box somewhere on your screen. You can type in your questions um, closer to the end of the presentation. I will cue you when it is time to do that. So let's get started. Um, today, we have Daryl and Ariana with us. Um, whoever, whoever of you guys wants to start, you can introduce yourselves. Ariana, you go first. All right. Um, my name is Ariana Lee. I'm an admissions counselor here with Quad. Um, and I graduated from Dartmouth College in 2017 with a bachelor's in neuroscience. And I've since been dedicating my time helping wonderful students and families like yourselves be guided through the complex, you know, admissions process. Well, it's not too complex, but love to answer the questions, especially what do I do now that I've submitted all my applications? How do I fill that time? So I'm loving, I would love to dive into that topic uh, with Daryl today. Hi, my name is Daryl Tiggle. I'm also an admissions consultant with Quad. And um, I've spent a long career on really both sides of the college admissions process. Um, I went to Union College in upstate New York and for a long time worked in their admissions office, really learning how admissions worked. And then from there moved on um, to Tufts University and uh, right outside of Boston, Massachusetts, um, where again, sort of learning a, a, a different type of admissions in terms of selectivity, but again, you know, consistently, you know, learned more about the process. And then I moved to the other side of the desk and became a, a director of college counseling at a private school uh, right outside of Baltimore. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working with Quad and seeing students really from all over the world. And it's been a, a, a really great way to, um, you know, spread the knowledge that I have uh, about this um, process, but also gain uh, a great deal of knowledge about what's going on in admissions and, and throughout the world. So I'm excited about this. Thank you guys so much for those lovely introductions. I'm so happy uh, to be hosting this webinar with you. So let's dive right in. We are gonna get into what happens, what exactly happens after you submit your primary application. Um, all right. Did you wanna, yes, Daryl. All right, so you know, <laughs> essentially, essentially, you know, there, there are a few things that, that will come up that aren't a surprise, right? Um, you're gonna have an application review, right? Um, this diagram is pretty simple, but the application review is pretty complex, right? And it's, it's, both, it's both swift in many ways and very thorough in many ways, and, and we'll get to that. Um, and then there'll be other things, sort of, we're gonna call it interview, right, if applicable, but getting a, an understanding of who you are you know, as a person, right? Um, some schools, because of volume, to sit down with you and have the one-to-one -one interview um, that may be beyond their ability in terms of capacity but many colleges and every college is, every college would love the opportunity to sit with you get to know you as a person right and then be able to make uh what will happen at the end the application decision um and a variety of application decisions you know happen with your college application so we can talk about uh you know those um those details as well but those are the three major things that happen. You're gonna submit your application. It's gonna get a thorough review. They're gonna to try to get to know you. Hopefully you'll get to know someone in, in the admissions offices where you're applying. And then you'll get some decisions that'll you know, put the ball back in your court to sort of make a decision on, on what your choice will be. Beautiful. Do you have anything to add to this, Ariana? It's pretty straightforward, but 
you good. All right, awesome. So we're good. Yes. Um, so we're gonna jump right in to the meat of this presentation, how applications are reviewed. We're gonna talk first about external factors that play a role in admissions decisions. Um, Ariana, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Um, so a huge thing to consider as well is applicant competition. A lot of uh, families will say, well, my student was the, you know, my child was the top in their class, this, this, and this. Well, you have to remember that <laughs> your child is also, or you are also going against a number of applicants who may be similar in profile or may offer a diverse um, viewpoint that the college really loves, or they have your application is your story. So think of it as well-rounded as possible. So colleges may have a highly competitive and diverse applicant pool, sometimes more than usual, sometimes depending on the year. Um, while your overall application may be strong, remember that you're in competition with other candidates who may be just as qualified. So if you're applying early, a type A personality, you're gonna find a lot of other similar candidates are also thinking the same way. I agree. I, 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 you know, she nailed it. And I think in terms of you know academic competition or applicant competition, that's going to to vary from year to year. So you really need to be focused on how you can best present yourself, and and just you have to know the competition is going to be keen, right? You're going to have you know lots of good students out there, but it's a it's always about understanding you still have to put your best foot forward, even if the competition is is gigantic. Absolutely. And we're going to go over that a little bit more later on in the presentation. So we have another external factor that plays an important role in your admissions decision. Uh, Daryl, do you want to take this one? Sure. You know, I think that the student body, right, depending on your co-applicants, your chances of getting into a college, it'll depend on the overall student body, right, that exists there and the applicant demographic, because colleges are trying to put together you know, a well-rounded, diverse student body. And what we used to call it when I was working in admissions and a, a term that I stole from one of my colleagues is that we were putting together intentional communities, right? And although intentional community was one in which the academic rigor was, was, was significant and we wanted students who had really, you know, you know sort of high achieving academic uh, profiles, we wanted a student body that was geographically diverse, was, you know, ethnically right. diverse, was, you know, an interest of people and the type of backgrounds they had in other ways diverse. So the student body and how you might enhance that student body will play a big role, you know, in the application, you know, journey for you. But in terms of what I like the students to think about when they're applying to college, um, colleges have institutional priorities. And, and building the kind of student body they want is one of their big, big priorities. And building it the exact way has to go beyond the numbers. Absolutely. And I will say to that too, every college wants successful alumni. So mm. they want to build those, like you said, those intentional communities. And they're going to be looking at your applications more or less as you know, how will this student thrive in this community? How will they help shape the others that are going into, in, that are that are gonna be in the cohort? Are you going to help mold others? Are you gonna be a positive influence or how will you handle this environment? So all of that goes into uh, play when they're reviewing your applications. So when you're creating that college list, you wanna think, am I matching up to this school's, you know, what is, how am I aligning to this school's values as well? Perfect. Beautifully said. All right, so just uh, just like a final word on these external factors. Yeah, um, so again, more often than not, applicants who don't get admitted into their program or college of choice, does not, it does not negate that you're not a great applicant. It just, you know, um, there are other factors that are at play as well. Um, so um, while this can be disheartening to hear, it's often due to these external factors that some students are not admitted. I know, shocker, right? Um, but this is why it's essential for you to learn and understand what makes you stand out as a candidate. And just because one school did not see your value does not mean that you cannot be successful and thrive at another university. And do you have anything to, yeah. I, you know, I totally agree. And one of the things I tell my students 
and uh, you know, and their families. Um, when you're not admitted to a to a college, it I, I don't want them to 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 process it. Is that I wasn't qualified, right? I wasn't you know I wasn't good enough, right? Um, even 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 I don't even like them saying I I wasn't admissible because you know in most cases you were admissible, right? Um, you weren't selected. Right, and if you're if you're applying to highly selective schools, think about that. You just weren't selected, but in terms of your your quality as a student and and a person, that that's not diminished by a decision to not admit you to a college. Beautifully said. All right, so we will move on. How applications are viewed, part two. These are the most significant factors um, that colleges consider in your application. All right, so. Daryl, do you want to get started with this? Sure. All right. Um, none of these things will become it will come to you as a surprise, right? Um, high school GPA, right? And that's a number, right? It's important because it gives you, uh, you know, gives them some context of your your academic journey. What kind of courses you've taken? If there's an AP curriculum that's available at your school, have you taken advantage of that? If not, have you taken the most difficult courses at your your school and what's the context of your GPA. So the number is important and your road to getting there is important, right? Um, personal attributes, you know, the your your academic right, profile is important, but I always tell my my students, um, your academic profile is kind of a quick read, right? Your GPA, I can understand it quickly after I read it, right? But your personal attributes, I have to get to know you through your essay, through your recommendations, um, getting to know the kind of things that sort of um, shape you as a person, right? Um, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go extracurriculars first, right? Um, because the, the things that you do outside of the classroom, um, they speak to how you choose to use the time that you're owned. You kind of have to go to school or you, you totally have to go to school, right? But the things that you do outside the classroom, um, those are choices that you're making. And, and it speaks to you know, how you value using your time and what things you like to do, what your passions are. And that helps colleges um, do the next thing that we're talking about is alignment, right? Um, I tell my students and, and my families, find a school that's a good match for you, right? not just in its name and its prestige or how well it's known, but how it aligns with your academic criteria, but also with your, with your personal criteria, right? And if you're someone who has a, a set of things that you like to do, make sure that that college sort of is a place where that can be nurtured. And if there's something that you wanna study, make sure that aligns with the type of place that you want to be. Amazing, do you wanna add anything to that, Ariana? I will say um, your match will, you, you don't have to try and craft uh, yourself to, to to the school that you are trying to get to, if that makes any sense. Like, don't try to force your identity because you think this is what the school is looking for. Instead, stand out, be you, be as you as you can. That's what your application is for. It's going to tell the story. And the school that is meant slash matching your persona, matching your, everything that you're interested in, matching that element of who you are, you will be matched to the school. So I just, I, I hate when students try and forge their way into a school because it becomes obvious in your application. So just remember that. Yeah, that's a great, great point. All right, so let's move on then. What do colleges want to see from their applicants? Ariana? Absolutely. So um, kind of what we were already talking about, your overall high school experience is going to, it's a, it's a wide variety of opportunities to take advantage of. So um, colleges want to see that you made the most out of, out of those opportunities. Were you taking the hardest classes available or were you taking classes that align to maybe what you're interested in? Um, how are your extracurriculars? Like Daryl said, what were you doing out of in your free time? That kind of tells that other story outside of the academic world. Um, they want to know that you applied yourself and made the most of these opportunities. And most importantly, why? Why did you choose to do the things that you did do? Mm -hmm. um, this shows them that you have the capacity to contribute to their institution, like we were talking about before. How are you going to fit in this campus's dynamic? How are you going to help mold or be molded um, by this by this university? Um, it'll show them that you're curious, eager to learn. You took initiative. You were dedicated. You stuck with um, 
let's say your first quarter GPA or your first quarter grade in a class wasn't the best, but you helped, you, you stuck with it, you dedicated yourself to meeting with the teacher afterwards and you improved those grades. That's the story they want to hear. What is what was your evolution throughout your career, uh, uh, throughout your time in high school? Amazing. And do you want to add anything to that, Daryl? I think you nailed it. You know, those are those are the things that they're they're looking to see, right? You know, what can you, you know, how will you contribute? You know, and and there are many ways that they're going to see you, but you know, Ariana really, you know, she nailed the things they want to see. Beautiful. Okay, so we have a couple more words on that. Okay. Yes. Oh, great. The and I think this is really good, and so I want everyone to listen to this closely because we're going to give you another piece of instruction around this, right? Um, what colleges look for will ultimately depend on their, listen to this, their mission, their vision, and core values, right? And that is something on almost every college website, you can go and, and search mission statement, vision statement, right? Or core values, right? So you can get an understanding is this college, is what they say, what they're saying that they are, right? And who they want to be, does that align with who I am, right? And then what they're gonna wanna see from you, right? Is academic excellence. And that may that might have been being a straight A student. That might be have been starting off as a C student, then becoming a B student, and then becoming an A student, right? So showing academic excellence and a commitment to academic uh, progress, um, pursuing diverse experiences, right? Even if you want to be a doctor, you know, having some, you know, interest in the arts, right? Even if you're an artist, right? Having some interest, you know, in the sciences, right? Um, show leadership capabilities, and that might be captain or, you know, president. It might be the person who started an organization at a school, right? It might be someone who leads by example because they're the person who always shows up, who always contributes, right? And they lead by example with their effort, right? And their presence, right? And then get involved in your community, right? Um, and then, you know, colleges are gonna ask you very directly, how have you been involved in your community, right? So make sure you're doing it, not just to answer that question, but because um, your community needs your smart young mind and energy, right? And that's something you're gonna be able to communicate when you're applying to college. Amazing. And do you have anything to add to that, Ariana? No, that's, that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. That was great. Thank you so much, Daryl. All right, yeah. so we're gonna go on to, I believe what is the last section of how applications are viewed. And we're gonna talk about other factors of your application. These are more things that are now kind of moving into the more optional side. So we are gonna go and dive into that. Awesome. Yeah, SAT, ACT scores. So um, post-COVID or since the pandemic, um, at, uh, schools have taken advantage of test optional. Um, so it's important to note that many schools are moving away from requiring standardized test scores. So making them optional for students to take. So it's very important to note that if you do submit it, it will be evaluated. It's not a you know, they, they will look at everything that you turn in. Um, so this means that if your SAT or ACT scores hold will hold less weight. However, if they're submitted, if you believe that they will positively impact your application, submit them. If you're on the border saying, hey, I don't know, um, this is kind of on their cutoff point, then maybe double, you know, second guess whether you submit them or not. Um, again, you can work with a quad education counselor, kind of figure out, hey, is this is this too, should I even submit this score? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of one of those gray areas. Definitely a question that's asked a lot is, will this be a something in the future? We can't guarantee, but as of right now, they are test optional. Do you have any anything else to say about standardized? Standardized yeah, I, I, yeah I just think we can we can we can give you really good counsel on the testing and Ariana she you know she you, she gave you the insights you needed right so um take testing right you know let, let's see how you perform and then in the landscape of the schools that you're applying to um you can choose the option of submitting it or not submitting it based on how your score lands in their sort of you know historical data of, of, of what they're admitting for 
students with regard to testing. And if you don't submit your testing, um, don't fear that because you haven't done so, you are now going to be you know, at risk because the college has allowed you to do so. They've invited you to do so. Amazing. OK, so then our last bit of this is interview. I know that these are super optional. Obviously, not a lot of colleges have the resources to conduct interviews on every single applicant. But can we talk about this a little bit? Certainly, right? Yeah, some schools will do interviews that are optional. Some schools, that optional interview, if you're offered that optional interview, you better opt in and take that, that option, right? Uh, because it's not something that's, uh, that's automatic, right? If you have the opportunity to do it, especially at your target school, it's a great way uh, to give admissions a better idea of who you are as a person, right? So if you have the option to it, and the advice I always give about interviews, right? And if you think about the college application process, and you know, traditionally ninth graders are what, 13 years old, 14 years old? 13, 14, right? So um, they're evaluating on, you, on some of that 13 year old stuff and that 14 year old stuff, right? And that 15 year old stuff. Right, um, but the, but when you're you're going to interview at 17 or 18, right? So although they're looking at a lot of stuff from your historical background, your interview in a really really obvious way um, enables you to tell them who you are now, and that's that's super helpful, super powerful in your application, um, you know, journey because you can tell them, hey, this is who I was and this is how I've developed. Right? These are the things I'm a passionate about. These are the things I'm going to do when I come to campus, and the interview is just a great way to, you know, essentially dictate your application to them. Awesome. Also, um, a positive note with interviews too. It's it's a great way to ask questions or or get to have a get to talk to someone who's either in the school environment or alumni of the school. Um, so it's a great way to kind of just flesh out any questions that you might have. I'm sorry, you you got it, Ariano. It's it, you're you're they're interviewing you, but please understand you're you're interviewing them too. The ultimate power move of the interview. <laughs> All right. So now that we've talked about factors that can affect um, how um, admissions officers review your application. We're going to talk about what you can do once you've submitted your application or or the some things you actually have to do. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's get into it. Awesome. So yes, I know the waiting period is the, it, it's the toughest time because you're like, what's happening? But remember to congratulate yourself. You've mm -hmm. gone through a very arduous process and it's just, you know, take, take the time to really applaud yourself for submitting the application. You got everything done in time. You were not procrastinating as much as you could have. Um, so really just um, applaud yourself there. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication throughout your high school career. So um, pat on the back there. Make sure you're also registering for those online applicant portals. Uh, this is where they will be communicating with you uh, via these portals. So they'll let you know if there's any additional documents that are needed, um, application status, any deadlines that might be coming up. Um, a, usually a place where you can submit a um, letter of continued interest um, within these applicant portals. Also, that's where you'll find out whether, you know, your decision. Um, complete supplementary application docs. So if there are any additional documents, application components that you still need to submit, uh, this is the time to do it. Make sure that you are following up with any, any particulars that still need to be wrapped up. If it's another recommendation, that you're waiting on, or if you are waiting for, um, you know, any status updates, just make sure you're getting that done during this time. And most importantly, something that a lot of students uh, think that they can now slack off because every all the applications are done. No one's going to check anything wrong. Keep your grades up. Um, there is something called a media report, as well as they'll check your grades even after you've gotten admitted to the school. So make sure that you keep your grades up. Um, Kaju will see how you perform when you submit your final transcript. Most admission offer, offers are conditional and they can be rescinded. And we would hate for that to happen to you after all the hard work you've done. Um, so make sure when it comes to academics, you keep that up so your acceptance does not get revoked. 
And I'll Amen. say that quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. Daryl, do you have anything to add to this? I mean, she, you know, she is right on <laughs> and that, you know, that, you know, the, the final party note, you know, keep your grades up, you know, um, and again, we get it. It just, there's a, some, somewhere between a nat natural, natural tendency or a, just a, a, you know, a, a power, a force that makes you want to slack off off towards you know and it's been happening since the beginning of high school you you know we've got to keep it you know keep it keep it you know strong through the finish line because you know and again not the fear of having your application uh decision rescinded which can happen that can happen but um you're you're heading towards college that's gonna be harder than high school Right, you don't want to. You don't want to stop learning as you're post, as you're about to hit the the more steep hill of learning. So you know, stay academically engaged. All right, amazing, beautifully said. <laughs> All right, so we will move on to the next. We've got we've got more things. Oh, oops, we've got more things here. Uh, what you should be doing after after you've submitted your application. Right? And look, and these are things we're, we're saying after you submitted your application, but we're going to call this application process a journey, right? Even after you submit your application, you're going to be submitting more application stuff, right? So we're going to highlight some things that are really important to make sure that you're doing, but, but know that the, the, once you hit submit, right, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to revisit that button, right? But yeah, you know, once you get the application details, um, you know, in order, um, applying for financial aid and applying for scholarships, that's important for you, right? Because college is a significant investment. And in the way that colleges sort of try to align how they're distributing their financial aid and their scholarships and the like, so they need to know, hey, who's needy, right? So we can start, you know, addressing them. And, you know, who's out there for whom we might be able to you know, provide additional funding that will help them, you know, like us more because it's more affordable and, you know, make us an option that that family can pursue. So get those applications done. Um, scheduling an, an, an interview, creating a balance, uh, you know, with the ease and the challenge of your coursework. The, the, the interview, we're saying schedule an interview if you can, um, schedule a visit, right, if you can't interview. Schedule a tour, right, if you can't interview. Um, if colleges are visiting your town and doing something at the Marriott or the Hyatt or the you know, high school in your area, um, schedule to be um, um, in a way that you can interact with them. So whether it be a formal interview or a way in which you're you know, meeting people in admissions, that can help you end admissions, right? Submitting a letter of interest and continued interest, an update letter, um, a letter of intent, um, uh, submitting a letter and staying engaged is something that we sort of put under the umbrella of, of demonstrating interest. And colleges want to know that you have an interest in them, right? And some colleges kind of know everyone's interested in them. But truth be told, that's a smaller group, right? Lots of really, really good, really, really prestigious, really, really selective schools. They kind of pay attention to whether or not you've engaged them in a way that helps them ascertain that that you have a keen interest in them. And this is the last one on this screen, but super important, super, super hard to digest though, right? Wait patiently, right? You gotta wait patiently. And um, it's a practice, right? That you're gonna have to do later in life as well. And, you know, work with Quad, we're gonna give you a lot of good counsel. If you tell us, hey, Mr. Tiggle, that waiting patiently thing, I just, there's no way I can do that. I'm gonna say, all right, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to talk about early decision, early action, the like. Then you don't have to wait so long, but it has different ramifications. But you know, wait patiently. And right now, right, we've we've recently received um, college admissions decisions, and some students have been put on something called the wait list, right? So even in the way that colleges will, will respond to you, you know, it's a it's it's kind of a waiting game and a and a patience a patience game. You have anything to add to that, Erin? Um, no, I, I would say um, while you're waiting for your financial aid or or if you're getting acceptances rolling in, um, I would check, make sure there are no deadlines for scholarships to apply to if there are any schools on your list that you are interested in going. 
um, make sure that you're just keeping track of, okay, when are these financial aid docs due or when are these scholarships due? Um, I know a lot of times um, they'll start sending the financial aid docs. Try and Try and wait, hold out if possible. That way you can kind of compare your financial aid packages and possibly barter with the school for additional funds. Just something to keep track of. So, something uh, Ariana really uh, touched on that's really important. Some schools, so say if, uh, a school might have an early action deadline, but you're not really interested in early action, but early action might be also the deadline to be uh, viable for certain scholarships. So again, we're going to counsel you through those details, but these are things that are sort of um, things you need to know along the way. But that's, uh, Ariana, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. That's, that's. All right. Thank you guys so much for that. All right. So we're going to move on to our next and final section of this presentation. We're going to talk about some tips on boosting your chances of getting into your dream school, kind of knowing how the review process goes, how can you use that to your advantage as you develop your applications? Absolutely. Um, oh, did I go the last time? I apologize. Is it me? Am I up? Who's up? All right, we'll, we'll, both, we'll both give you a chance. <laughs> I'd say so look, so look, this is, this is one of the things also, right? Um, tips for getting into your dream school. One of the things I say, and consider this, how about a couple dream schools, uh, right? Maybe three or four dream schools, uh, right? Because that 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 dream school, I think, is it's a good thing. But I think if you can get sort of a a, a, a group of schools that will not just satisfy your needs, schools at which you can go and thrive and that will be excellent for you, I guarantee you, you can find more than one. So that, that's point one, right? Um, maximize your time and start planning early. Right? If you can afford to, to do so, and we know high school is busy, right? We know it's a busy life. Um, planning your application as early as you can, um, just, to, just to get a timeline in order, right? So planning, planning your class schedule, right? Researching schools you might be interested in, you know, taking part in meaningful extracurricular, extracurricular activities and, and you know, doing things that make a difference, right? Um, start planning early and, um, and strategizing. Right, show initiative. Right, colleges look for candidates that show leadership skills and initiative. So be your, do your best to be proactive. Um, you know, during your high school, you know, experience, and also during the college application experience. You know, show your passion. Right, take on more responsibilities as you're able to do so, so that you're showing that you know I'm the kind of person when I get to a place. Uh, I, I bring, you know, I bring a lot of talent, but you know, I've got the initiative to to learn new things, do new things, make a new impact, right? And, and then the things that you're already good at, that you're already, you know, passionate about, lean into your interests, right? You know, to do well, uh, you know, stick with some of the things that you're already good at, right? That you might be able to be captain of, or chairperson of, or or, or president of, right? And again, you don't have to do those things to be uh, someone demonstrating leadership skills, but if you lean into the things that you like the most or that you're that you're most talented at, you know, I think it will give you opportunities to see how you can lead, right? Because, right, you you should and lead other people to be equally talented in that endeavor as you might be. Absolutely. And I, I will add to um, add to that and say it's never too early if you want to get a head start on testing or or practicing writing to different prompts. You can go, um, I mean, go go create a common app account today and you know just start looking at what some of your dream school's prompts are and start practice writing them. Um, it's never too early to start. Number one. <laughs> Awesome. All right. And then we will move on to some more tips. Ariana. Awesome. So learning what makes you stand out. And that's uh, pretty hard because we're all still trying to figure ourselves out even to this day. Um, so knowing what you need to include, uh, just start brainstorming, start thinking of what are some, what are some 
I don't know, something that's really impacted you. Um, what is what has been an evolutionary um, uh, a development for you? Anything that has been pivotal to you or anyone that has helped you come to this pivotal moment? It doesn't have to necessarily be a big, you know, um, a moment or idea, light bulb, but you can just start brainstorming and start working with others to develop what your theme should be to help you stand out further. And of course, look at your passions. What are you interested in? Let that be your inspiration um, to further develop. Tailoring your college list. So after you figured out, you know, who you are and, and what you love and what your passions are, then you can start looking at colleges um, that also match that persona of what you're looking for um, that can help succeed. Think big picture. If you're looking to do pre-med, what are schools that help stand out for medical school and so on and so forth? Think think further down the line. Um, helping tailor your college list, look at academic standing, values, goals, um, things that are essential to getting accepted and succeeding throughout your academic journey there. And remember that your application should have your best interest in mind, your best interest in mind. So it's not just about the school, it's about you. So again, look at what is going to help me develop to be the best person. Is this school going to help me do that? You're putting a financial, uh, you know, you're putting your money down as well to a particular institution. So you want to help, you want to make sure that that institution is helping you out. Awesome. And do you have anything to add to this, Daryl? Yeah, I, you, know, I, I, you know, the thing I need to add or like to add is um, this is what I like to do most as a college admissions consultant, right? Help students understand what makes them stand out. And look, we say it and like it's easy to do, you know, do some brainstorming, right? Imagine who you are, right? And we know some of you will bite that up and, and go right ahead and do it, right? But that's kind of what we hope you do as, 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 as counselors, is help you articulate your strengths, help you articulate sort of the criteria that are most important to you. And then the thing I really like, um, I like the tailoring the college list. I like the building the list. And I don't know if you know, but a lot of people out there are really anxious about this whole college admissions game, right? And, you know, you know what's going on at selective admissions, you know, places. And they're like, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like gambling. Like, nope, it, it, it might be, right? The, the odds are not good, but I say, think about it more like in the way that you, you invest, right? You, you invest, right? And you, you know, and this is the way we do it. You know, you invest in things that are pretty, pretty good, right? Pretty good, you know, certainty that you're gonna have some returns, things where you'll take a little more risk and things where you'll take longer shots. Um, we give advice as to how you should invest your college admissions effort, time, and money. And, and I would be modest and not say this, we do it super well, right? We're, we're really good at helping students, you know, guide themselves and their families, you know, through the process. That's all. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for that. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to the Q&A section of tonight's webinar. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, throw them in the Q&A box. But as we wait for those to come in, I just wanted to ask uh, Daryl and Ariana if you have any kind of final words, any anecdotes perhaps, um, or advice that you'd like to share with our participants? Yeah, the thing I tell my students when we're, we're talking about just this topic, and there are a lot of topics around, you know, college admission. So I think about sort of, you know, what happens to your, your application, right? How, or how college application decisions are made. I tell them, think, think about them to simplify it, right? Um, college admissions decisions are made in, in two ways. They're either data driven, right? It's about the numbers, you know, what's your GPA, what's your testing, what's your number of different things, right? Or it's holistic, right? They're taking, you know, a really, um, you know, a comprehensive look at who you are, right? From your writing, from what people are writing about you, right? So the, 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 the journey that you've lived as a person, um, almost all colleges, would like to do that holistic review where they get to know the student and they can make a decision on, on the person. But a lot of this process because, excuse me, a volume of selectivity of, you know, 
other factors, you know, has to intersect with data. So I go, make sure that you're understanding the the science of college admissions, right? There's there's lots of stuff that if you if you're paying close attention to how they're doing admissions and how you would like the admissions journey to end for you, which for me, I would like it to end with my students, for my students with a lot of wins, right? And you know, again, I'd like them to be wins at, at big schools with great names, but a lot of losses at big schools with great names does not thrill me at all. And we win, by the way. <laughs> yes, Ariella. Absolutely. Um, I was going to also say to that, um, just because I, I know, know the waiting period is, is the toughest, but um, also remember when the results come back. And um, although, like Daryl said, we do have a lot of wins, but um, I always caution, do not put, you know, um, do not be completely discouraged if you do not get into the school of your choice, your dream school. And again, it should be dream schools, like Daryl said. Um, but if that is the case, and you're really just really um, set on getting into this particular school, there are transfer opportunities available too that can also um, that can also be an option if it's just a must for this particular institution. But again, just remember that you can be successful at many different places. And again, it has to be a match. There Things happen for a reason and perhaps the application at that particular time, that particular year, those particular factors that we talked about earlier caused your application to not be selected. It does not mean that you are not a great student. All right, amazing. Okay, so we have some questions popping up. So we'll move on to this here. All right, someone asks, uh, would you say that there is an inference that if you aren't submitting a test score, that it must not be strong? And would that impact someone's acceptance? Right. I want to say this loudly and clearly, right? Um, we totally get how one might have that suspicion, but you need to know um, that's, a, that's a concern you can totally put to rest. There are schools that do indeed still require testing and they super care about it. Testing is super important to them. The schools that have gone test optional have said, look, this, this is not important enough to us for you to not apply. And we cannot punish you for this because, and, and again, don't overthink this. Half of the people are saying, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not submitting my testing. Here's my application, right? Uh, but but please do know, colleges aren't even not all not all are they not thinking twice about it. They're not thinking once about it. If they if they've written we are test optional, um, way before they were able to put that in print, their lawyers, their dean, their president said, "Don't you ever, don't you ever make this a situation." And even beyond that, they just, please no, no. They do not infer better. Yeah, you know, they say, they probably say, they, they say this student didn't test great, but they, they don't say this student didn't, this student test badly, but in fact, they just don't think about it. They cannot assume <laughs> what is <laughs> not there. Yeah. That, would, that would be very problematic for anybody to do so. We can only go what's, what's available to us. All right, let us move on to the next question. Someone here is asking whether or not they should apply for financial aid once they get accepted or before then. That's a super easy one. You yeah. have to apply before, not, not necessarily before uh, you apply for admission, but you know, simultaneously with your application. Yes, and I think with scholarships as well, you can start applying for those as soon as you're in high school, so you don't even have to wait. Right. It would likely be best to just get as much funding as you can. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, 
here someone is asking about passion projects which we could go into because i think that it shows a lot of like initiative and leadership and they're asking about the nature of a passion project they're wondering whether or not it should be connected with a school activity or whether or or if it can be a, a personal project I would say if it is connected to a school activity, it's kind of building off of building blocks that are already set. However, it can be your passion project is your passion. That is something that that's an endeavor that you're taking on to um, one, maybe you want to research a topic more heavily. You want to implement something new that could be helpful to your community. Um, it can be in many different sectors. It could be volunteering. It could be your own hobbies. It could it could be lab research. Um, it's more so showing to admissions that you are carrying this project through. If you're starting something, maybe working with a mentor or someone that can help legitimize your project as well as keep you accountable. Um, those that that is what I would recommend for the passion project. Less so on the school activity and more so what are you doing with the passion project and why is it something that you chose to pursue. I, I totally agree. And one of the things I, I want students to do is, um, and I might be wrong, but I think I'm right about this. Um, stop overthinking passion. It it does it's like it's like Ariana said, it's seeing it through, it's sort of pursuing something that you're interested in. And again, I'm gonna be a little funny. It it's it's not the same kind of passion that that's parallel par paralleled with love. We're not talking about the stuff. You love most to do, right? I I love fishing, right? I love fishing. I'm a deep sea fisherman. I'm I'm passionate about that, but I I probably can't write a whole bunch. I could maybe, but um, that's what I love to do, right? Uh, but my sort of passion is, you know, in my work is informing people about how to navigate the college process, right? So this is the work that I do, right? So um, like Ariana said, it's the stuff that you're interested in, that you're seeing through, that you're investigating to, to come up with some discoveries, but you you could love it. You don't have to be in love. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So someone is asking, and I think I'm going to add a bit to their question. They're asking, how would you find the historical data for test score cutoffs and GPA data? And what I will add to that is that if you do choose to submit standardized test scores, um, would it be beneficial to actually look at that historical data and use that as a reference as to whether or not you should be submitting those test scores? So I, you know, tell me if I'm answering the question correctly. So. Uh, and, and give me, paraphrase it for me one more time. How do you find the historical data on? Yes, so the part one, which is uh, what one of our uh, participants are asking is how and where do you find historical data for test score cutoffs and GPA for, for colleges? Gotcha. So, but, so this is gonna be a little bit disappointing. Um, the cutoffs, and trust me, you won't find that anywhere on any website anywhere right colleges colleges create have to um, have to have something called the common data set and every college has it you can google it and then find it and what they typically produce is what's the middle 50 percent um uh ranges for for test scores for gpa um the information might be there but it's also super disappointing because some schools have an a b c d e f g grade scale, some schools have a zero to a hundred grade scale, some schools have a 4.0, what have you, grade scale. I think that, I think that, I think that research is interesting if you love statistics. I hate to tell you, it ain't going to help you at all, all ascertain navigating the college process, right? It's really more about how strong the application is, how the student fits into their institutional priorities, which is not listed in the common data set. It's listed in that thing we mentioned before, values, mission statement. I'd read that super close. I'd spend very little time on the common data set and it's deep. It'll give you everything you need to know. 
and nothing that you can use. <laughs> but I mean, it's public data and it's out there. It's called the common data set. Every single school has it and it's got more, more data than you could ever digest. Totally useless. <laughs> yeah, like if, if you look up, let's say, um, a school, Harvard, Harvard's average GPA, um, it, like like Daryl said, it's going to be a fifty. You know, it's it's going to give you the average. But there are students that got in that are that have a lower typical GPA, and there are students that got in that have, you know, what I mean. So it, it's hard to base it off of that. Um, if you're creating your college list or working to create that, then of course have your safeties, matches, and reaches based off based loosely around the averages, um, just to give you an idea of where that might fall. Um, the single most important information, if you want to look at data, and it, it, it's super public, and it's gospel. Like, this is admit rate. Admit mm -hmm. rate. Re and really, regardless what the common data set says, admit rate. And every school, you can, you can get that. Before you finish the line in Google, it'll give you the admit rate. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I I agree too. Make it more focused on your what story this about your application, less so what is you know how do I fit within this uh, within this data set that you don't have access to. So, all right, awesome. I think we're gonna do uh, maybe two more questions. Um, so someone is asking. Uh, for schools that have early decision or early action, does applying for regular decision lower your chances of getting accepted? Or, or I guess, would applying for early decision or early action increase your chances of getting accepted? It's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, applying early decision easily doubles your chances. And I need people to understand that early decision easily doubles your chances if you're qualified. Not if you're not qualified. It doesn't make you more. It doesn't make you more um, early action. And please understand, <laughs> this does not increase your chances at all. It it does not have an advantageous, you know, ring. But it does give you the advantage of the college seeing your application early, right? Um, which communicates some kind of interest, right? It might also make you in better stead for scholarship but it, it doesn't have the same admissions leverage that early decision does. And that's something that I, I, I have to train everyone that I'm working with because they're thinking, yeah, early decision, early action, same thing. I'm like, no, night, day, night, day, right? But early decision, if it works for you and the school the right choice and you can afford it and you're one of my counselees, we're going to talk a lot about early decision because it has lots of implications in the process. Yeah, and the only only thing too with early decision, you are committing fully to that school. So make sure this yeah. is the school that you want to go to. Um, yeah. But I mean, a, an early action does increase uh, or it does allow you the advantage to see if you are accepted or wait more likely. They, they may wait list. Um, to regular decision anyway. Um, you also are competing against the pool that got all of their application material ready at the same time. So you're competing against a fiercer pool in, in a lot of instances. Um, it doesn't lower your, your chances if you're not doing early decision. Oh, you're muted, Bianca. You're, you're muted, Bianca. Thank you. <laughs> we are going to answer one last question. Um, all right. So it is, what would you say, in your opinion, is the most important factor in the application process? If you guys were to, I don't know if you can choose one thing, but maybe, maybe an approach or I don't know, but that's, that's the question. <laughs> a lot of time in this cotton city. <laughs> um I, I will say uh some that Daryl said um also but approaching it from uh, um telling telling your story telling who you are focusing on your application component of how you're coming across that that way 
and less on the um, on numbers or, or on the statistics of how you might fit in. Don't try and look at a bunch of essays and try and recreate somebody else's essay. Focus on you, focus on how you're bringing your story to light and not mold yourself into what you think a school will like. That would be my piece of advice. I, no, I think, I think that, that's, so, so again, uh, uh, read the question to me again, Bianca. Yes, absolutely. So if there was one single factor of an application or the application that you would focus on, okay, um, what would it be? Perfect. I'll, yes, perfect. okay. Perfect. All right. <laughs> So uh, uh, like, like Ariana said, that, that, that one single factor thing, it's just kind of, it, it, if it was that easy, you wouldn't need us, right? We could say, all right, get really good grades. Oops, 90% of the group has good grades. Get good testing. Oops, 90% has good testing. Have a good resume. Oops, 90% of the pool has a good resume. Right. So there there is not there is not a silver bullet. There's not a factor that makes that's most important. So there is a thing. Right. And this will sound disappointing, but you really do have to think about it. There is a thing that is most important. And when I ask colleges, oh, my God, how did Bianca get in? Oh, my God, you guys are admitting her. I love her. But how'd you get in? Or my God, how, how did Ariane get again? What? And what they say is authenticity, right? The students so authentically um, matched who we are, right? And some students, and we know that you want to reach, right? Um, but sometimes if you're a B student and you're reaching for an A school, right? It's just, it's, it's just a, it's a, a hard uphill climb, right? But if you're applying to schools where you're a, a really good match, they think how well has this student told the story about their academic interest and their journey, um, how well have they described their background and how it will enrich our place, right? And, and how well have they talked about why our institution will help them get to where they want to get to next in life, right? So a way in which they've said, this is who I am. I understand who you guys are. And, and this is why I'm a good match, right? And you get, a, you get a chance to tell your own story in your common application personal statement. And then each college is going to say, you know, why Wellesley, you know, why Georgetown, you know, why Hopkins. And then you can tell them, this is why your school is a good match for me. And that's where that authenticity comes in. Don't tell them you've got great professors. Don't tell them you've got a beautiful campus. Don't tell them you've got a nice library. 101% of the schools do, right? Tell them authentically why it's a good match. Authenticity. Beautifully said. All right. With that, we will end today's webinar. Thank you so much, Daryl and Ariana, for joining us today. If you guys have any questions, I know we have a bunch of questions that we didn't end up answering. Uh, please feel free to send us an email if you have very specific questions about your own situation. Um, please do uh, book a free consultation with us. Um, so that's it for tonight. Thank you again for joining us and have a great one. Bye. Thank you.